A black cop secretly follows a young girl convinced she's up to no good. But as he digs deeper, he uncovers a web of lies and corruption that could destroy everything he thought he stood for. The girl isn't just running from trouble. She's hiding the key to exposing a dangerous secret that powerful people would do anything to keep buried. Why did he follow her? And how will the truth leave him with a regret that changes his life forever? This is a story of betrayal, courage, and redemption that you won't forget. Before we get into the story, comment below where in the world you are watching from today. Terence Lewis guided his patrol car through the familiar streets of Lincoln Heights, where the setting sun cast long shadows across crumbling sidewalks. The evening air carried a mix of food cooking from nearby homes and the distant rumble of traffic from the highway. His hands rested easily on the steering wheel, but his mind was anything but relaxed. A group of kids played basketball with a bent rim, their laughter echoing off boarded-up storefronts. They waved as his car passed, and Terence raised his hand in return, a small smile touching his lips. These moments made him proud to wear the badge, to be a presence that kids could look up to rather than fear. But that pride always came with a weight. He watched in his rearview mirror as the kids' mothers called them inside, their faces tight with worry even in these early evening hours. The same scene played out daily, children being pulled indoors before darkness could claim the streets. Can't blame them, Terence muttered to himself, passing a liquor store with bars on its windows. Systems broken on both sides. He slowed the car as he approached Miss Irma Green's house, one of the few properties with actual flowers growing in the front yard. The elderly woman was out with her watering can, tending to her small garden like she did every evening. Terence pulled over and stepped out of his car. Evening, Miss Irma, he called out, approaching her white picket fence, the only one left on the block. Officer Lewis, she smiled, her weathered face brightening. Just the person I wanted to see. She set down her watering can, wiping her hands on her apron. Been meaning to tell you about some strange faces I've been seeing around here lately. Terence leaned against the fence post. Strange how? Well, Miss Irma adjusted her glasses. There's this young girl I keep seeing. Can't be more than 15 or 16. Been hanging around the past few days looking lost, but like she's trying not to look lost, if you know what I mean. Terence nodded, his expression thoughtful. Where have you seen her? Usually near Wilson's liquor store. Wearing a hoodie, carrying a backpack. Looks too young to be out here alone. I'll keep an eye out. Terence assured her, making a mental note. Back in his patrol car, Terence felt the familiar tension in his shoulders, the weight of straddling two worlds that seemed to grow further apart each day. His fellow officers kept their distance, their casual jokes masking deeper suspicions. Meanwhile, some community members saw his uniform before they saw his skin, their eyes filled with distrust despite his best efforts. As he turned onto Wilson Street, he spotted her immediately, the girl Miss Irma had described. She stood near the liquor store, wearing a gray hoodie that had seen better days, a worn backpack clutched close to her body. Her eyes darted around constantly, scanning faces and cars with nervous energy. Terence pulled his car into a spot with a clear view but kept his distance. The girl, Lily, according to the name he'd later learn, shifted her weight from foot to foot, checking her phone periodically. Everything about her body language screamed that she was either waiting for someone or hiding from someone. He watched as she pulled her hoodie tighter despite the mild evening temperature, her young face a mask of worry that seemed too heavy for her years. His instincts, honed by years on the force, told him something wasn't right. But experience had also taught him that rushing in wasn't always the answer. For now, he would watch and wait, ready to step in if needed. The next evening painted Lincoln Heights in shades of amber and long shadows. Terence's patrol car rolled quietly past the same corner where he'd spotted the girl yesterday. Sure enough, there she was again. Same worn hoodie, same backpack. But something was different today. Lily's movements were more erratic, her head turning sharply at every passing car. She kept fidgeting with her backpack straps, her fingers working nervously at the frayed edges. Her eyes darted between the street corners like a trapped animal looking for escape routes. What's got you so spooked? 
Terence murmured to himself, easing his foot off the gas to maintain a greater distance. He watched as she paced the corner, checking her phone every few seconds. The screen's blue glow illuminated her face, showing dark circles under her eyes that hadn't been there yesterday. When a car backfired a few blocks away, she nearly jumped out of her skin. Making a quick decision, Terence pulled into an empty parking lot and cut his engine. He kept his eyes on Lily through the side mirror, noting how she kept glancing over her shoulder at nothing in particular. Finally, she moved. Her steps were quick but uncertain as she turned down Mason Street, one of the narrower side roads. Terence waited a few moments before following on foot, keeping to the shadows of the buildings. His years of experience made his footsteps nearly silent on the cracked concrete. Lily disappeared into Wheeler Alley, a narrow passage between two abandoned warehouses. Terence held back, positioning himself behind a dumpster where he could hear without being seen. The girl's voice carried in the quiet evening air, trembling and hushed. I think someone's following me, she whispered into her phone. A pause. No, not right now, but earlier. I saw the same car twice. Another pause, longer this time. Her breath hitched. I don't know what to do if he finds me. Terence's police instincts kicked into high gear. The fear in her voice was real, not the nervous guilt of someone up to no good, but genuine terror. He could hear her pacing in the alley, her sneakers scuffing against the ground. I can't go back there, she continued, her voice breaking. You know I can't, just... Just tell me what to do next. She fell silent, listening to whoever was on the other end. From his position, Terence could see her shadow on the ground, shoulders hunched, free arm wrapped around herself like a shield. Every few seconds, she'd glance toward the alley's entrance, ready to bolt at the slightest sound. Making careful mental notes about her conversation and behavior, Terence stayed perfectly still. His mind was already cataloging possibilities, domestic abuse, trafficking, witness protection. Whatever it was, this girl needed help, even if she didn't know it yet. But approaching her now, when she was already spooked, would only make things worse. As Lily ended her call and wiped her eyes with her sleeve, Terence remained in the shadows. He'd need to handle this carefully, build a fuller picture before making any moves. Something dangerous was happening in his neighborhood and this girl was caught right in the middle of it. The fluorescent lights of the precinct buzzed overhead as Terence scrolled through recent reports on his computer. His coffee sat untouched, growing cold beside his keyboard. He'd arrived an hour before his shift, determined to find any mention of a teenage girl matching Lily's description. Missing persons? Nothing. Juvenile complaints? No matches. Suspicious persons? The same dead ends. He rubbed his tired eyes, frustrated by the lack of information. Later that evening, the setting sun cast long shadows across Lincoln Heights. Terence's patrol car turned onto Mason Street, and there she was, but different this time. Lily sat hunched on the concrete steps of the old Peterson building, her backpack clutched tight against her chest. She looked smaller somehow, more vulnerable than when she'd been pacing the street corner. Terence parked his car and approached slowly, keeping his hands visible. Hey there, he called out softly. I'm Officer Lewis. Everything okay? Lily's head snapped up, her eyes narrowing. Why are you following me? She demanded, her voice sharp with accusation. I've seen your car three days in a row now. I could ask you the same thing, Terence replied calmly, maintaining a safe distance. You've been in this area every evening this week. Maybe I live around here, she shot back, but her voice wavered slightly. We both know that's not true. Terence took another careful step forward. Look, if you're in some kind of trouble... I'm not the one in trouble, Lily interrupted, standing up suddenly. Her hands trembled as she gripped her backpack straps. You are... Terence frowned. What do you mean? Lily bit her lip, seeming to wrestle with a decision. Finally, she blurted out, My father, Marcus Parker, he's been watching you. He thinks you're involved in something and he's... She trailed off, looking away. He's planning something. Against you. The name hit Terence like a punch to the gut. Marcus Parker. 
He'd heard whispers about the man, but nothing concrete. Your father? He asked, keeping his voice steady despite his racing thoughts. And why are you telling me this? Because... Lily's voice cracked slightly. Because I don't want anyone else to get hurt. Terence studied her face carefully, looking for signs of deception. The fear in her eyes seemed genuine, but something about the story didn't add up. Why would Marcus Parker target him specifically? And why would his daughter risk warning him? He wanted to believe her, but years of police work had taught him to be cautious. The girl seemed sincere, but he'd seen good liars before. The records room's musty air filled Terence's lungs as he pulled another dusty file from the shelf. His sandwich sat forgotten on the corner of the metal desk, his appetite lost in the growing mystery of Marcus Parker's case. The official report painted Marcus as a violent offender who had assaulted Officer James Reeves during a routine traffic stop. But something felt off. The incident report was thin on details, and several witness statements were conspicuously missing. Most troubling were the sealed portions of the file, unusual for a straightforward assault case. Terence leaned back in his chair, rubbing his temples. Three years ago, Marcus Parker had been a maintenance worker at City Hall with a clean record except for a speeding ticket. Then suddenly, he was branded a dangerous fugitive. The transition made no sense. Hey, Lewis, you planning to live down here? Officer Martinez's voice startled him. Terence quickly closed the file. Just catching up on some old cases, he replied casually, waiting until Martinez left before slipping the file into his bag for later review. That evening, Terence parked his unmarked car near the corner where he'd first spotted Lily. The streetlights flickered to life as dusk settled over Lincoln Heights. Right on schedule, Lily appeared, wearing the same worn hoodie but looking more alert than ever. She walked with purpose, but her movements were erratic. Every few steps, she'd pause to scan her surroundings, sometimes doubling back or crossing the street unexpectedly. The backpack bounced against her shoulders as she walked, and Terence noticed how she kept one hand on the strap at all times, like it contained something precious. Following at a distance, Terence watched her zigzag through side streets and alleys. Her route seemed designed to shake any tail, a pattern he recognized from his training. This wasn't random teenage behavior. Someone had taught her these evasion techniques. The inconsistencies in Marcus's file, Lily's practiced movements, her earlier warning about her father, it all pointed to something bigger than a simple assault case. Terence gripped his steering wheel tighter, knowing he couldn't ignore his instincts. Whatever was really going on, Lily needed protection and he was determined to uncover the truth. The afternoon sun beat down on Lincoln Heights as Terence watched Lily emerge from a small, weathered house three blocks from his position. She adjusted her backpack straps and started walking, her shoulders tense despite the casual way she tried to blend in with the afternoon crowd. Terence kept his distance, letting a delivery truck and several pedestrians stay between them. Lily moved with purpose, weaving through the neighborhood's busy streets. She stopped briefly at a corner store, pretending to look at the window display while checking her surroundings. The local food bank operated out of an old church basement, its faded sign promising hope and help to those in need. Terence watched as Lily disappeared inside. After a few minutes, he followed, nodding to the elderly volunteer at the entrance. Inside, fluorescent lights hummed overhead as Lily methodically selected canned goods, beans, vegetables, soup, she carefully checked expiration dates, choosing items with the longest shelf life. Her movements were practiced, suggesting this wasn't her first visit. When she emerged, stuffing the last can into her already bulging backpack, Terence stepped forward. Lily, he called softly. She froze, then spun around, eyes wide with recognition and fear. You again. Why are you following me? I'm concerned about you. Terence kept his voice gentle. What's going on with all these supplies? Lily's fingers tightened on her backpack straps. It's none of your business. Is this about your father? About Marcus? Her face hardened at the mention of her father's name. After a long moment, she spoke, her voice barely above a whisper. Dad says we need to be ready. Things are getting dangerous and we might have to leave quickly. Dangerous how? Terence asked taking care to maintain a non-threatening distance. You don't understand, Lily's voice cracked slightly. 
Dad's not what they say he is. He's trying to fix things, but they won't let him. She glanced nervously over her shoulder. Don't tell anyone at the station about this. The police, they're part of it. They'll hurt him if they find him. I want to help, Terrence offered, but Lily was already backing away. Stay away from us, she warned, her voice trembling. Just stay away. She turned and hurried down the street, leaving Terrence standing alone outside the food bank, watching her disappear into the crowd. Lily, Terrence said, keeping his voice gentle. I just want to help. Her eyes darted around, checking for other people nearby. You shouldn't be following me. I'm worried about you. A young girl shouldn't be out alone, preparing to run away. Lily's shoulders slumped slightly. You don't understand. None of you do. She turned and walked away, her backpack rattling with canned goods. Terrence returned to his car but didn't start it. Instead, he watched as Lily made her way through the neighborhood's winding streets. She finally stopped at a small house with peeling yellow paint and a roof that sagged in the middle like a tired spine. The yard was wild with knee-high grass and untamed bushes pushing through a broken chain-link fence. He waited in his car, watching the house as the evening shadows grew longer. Through a grimy window, he could see movement, shadows passing back and forth. After 30 minutes, he made his decision. The wooden steps creaked under his feet as he approached the front door. He knocked, and after a long pause, heard shuffling inside. Lily opened the door just enough to peer out. Officer Lewis, she said flatly, may I come in? She hesitated, then opened the door wider. The living room was cluttered but tidy with mismatched furniture that had seen better days. Framed photos covered one wall, younger versions of Lily, a man who must be Marcus and an elderly woman. Marcus, is that you? A thin voice called from another room. An elderly woman in a faded house dress appeared, her white hair wispy around her face. She smiled at Terrence, her eyes bright but unfocused. You're home early today. Grandma, this isn't Dad, Lily said quickly, taking the woman's arm. This is Officer Lewis, he's just visiting. The papers, Helen mumbled, reaching for Terrence's sleeve. Did you hide them like those men said? They were so angry last time. Grandma, let's get you some tea, Lily interrupted, shooting Terrence a warning look. She guided Helen toward what appeared to be the kitchen. Those men in the nice suits, Helen continued, her voice drifting back. They wanted the papers so badly. Terrence stood among the family photos, studying Marcus Parker's face. He looked different in these pictures. Happier, unburdened. When Lily returned, she practically pushed Terrence toward the door. On the porch, she grabbed his arm. Wait, she said, her voice barely above a whisper. Dad's been leaving me messages, notes, clues. I don't understand them all yet, but I know they're important. The morning sun cast long shadows across the overgrown lawn as Terrence approached the Parker house, a pink box of donuts in his hand. The screen door creaked as he knocked and he heard shuffling inside. Lily opened the door just enough to peer out. What do you want? Brought breakfast, Terrence said, lifting the box. For your grandmother. And maybe we could talk? Helen's voice called from inside. Who's there, dear? It's Officer Lewis, Grandma, Lily answered, her eyes still locked on Terrence. After a moment's hesitation, she opened the door wider. Inside, Helen sat in a worn armchair, her thin hands folded in her lap. Her face brightened at the sight of the donuts. Oh, how thoughtful. While Helen enjoyed her treat, leaving a trail of powdered sugar on her lap, Terrence sat at the kitchen table with Lily. The morning light filtered through dusty windows, illuminating the tired lines around her young eyes. Your father, Terrence began carefully. You mentioned he left you clues? Lily glanced at her grandmother, then reached into her pocket. She pulled out a crumpled piece of paper, smoothing it against the table's scratched surface. The handwriting was hurried, but clear. They're not who they seem. Trust no one in uniform. Terrence's stomach tightened as he read the words. Police corruption wasn't new to him. He'd seen enough to know it existed, but seeing it written so plainly made his badge feel heavy. What else has he told you, he asked. I can't. Lily pulled the paper back. He says it's dangerous to share too much. 
From the living room, Helen's voice rose suddenly. The papers, Marcus. Did you hide the papers? Her eyes were wide, unfocused. Those men, they'll come looking. Grandma, it's okay. Lily interrupted, rushing to her side. Everything's fine. How about we watch your favorite show? Terence watched the interaction, noting how quickly Lily redirected her grandmother. Whatever Marcus was involved in, it had clearly left deep marks on this family. As he stood to leave, his mind was already racing through possibilities. Something about this case didn't add up, and the answers might be closer to home than he wanted to admit. Terence sat in the dim light of the records room, surrounded by the hum of fluorescent bulbs and the musty smell of old files. Marcus Parker's case folder lay open before him, its pages spread across the metal desk. Something about the assault report didn't add up. The official statement claimed Marcus had attacked Officer James Reynolds during a routine traffic stop, but the details were oddly vague. No mention of specific injuries, no dashboard camera footage, no witness statements. Just bare-bones documentation that felt more like an outline than a proper police report. This makes no sense. Terence muttered, flipping through the pages again. Several sections were marked sealed by court order, which was unusual for a simple assault case. The timestamps didn't match up either. There was a three-hour gap between the alleged incident and when it was reported. Terence pulled out his phone and dialed Derek Campbell's extension. Derek had been handling records for 15 years and knew every case file like the back of his hand. Hey, Derek. Got a minute to look at something? Sure, what's up? Derek's voice crackled through the speaker. The Marcus Parker case from three years ago, assault on Officer Reynolds. Something seems off about it. There was a long pause. When Derek spoke again, his voice was lower, more guarded. Listen, Terrence, you're a good cop, smart. But some cases, some cases are better left alone. What do you mean? I mean drop it. Derek's tone hardened. Trust me on this. Whatever you think you found, whatever you're looking for, it's not worth the trouble it'll bring. The warning only made Terence's suspicions grow stronger. He looked back at the file, at the inconsistencies that now seemed to jump off the page. If Marcus had been framed, if there really was corruption involved. Thanks for the advice, Derek, Terence said finally, closing the folder. As he stood to leave the records room, Terence's mind was made up. He needed to find Marcus Parker and hear his side of the story. Whatever truth lay buried in these files, his own department seemed determined to keep it hidden. The streetlights cast long shadows across Lily's backyard as Terence crouched behind a weathered fence. His heart pounded as he watched a figure move stealthily through the darkness toward the back door. The man's movements were careful, practiced. Clearly, someone used to staying hidden. Terence drew his weapon but kept it lowered. Marcus Parker, he called out firmly but quietly. Don't move. The figure froze. In the dim light, Terence could make out a gaunt face with several days' worth of stubble. Marcus Parker looked older than his photo, worn down by years on the run. Dad! Lily burst through the back door, placing herself between the two men. Officer Lewis isn't like the others. Please, just listen to him. Marcus's eyes darted between his daughter and Terence, his body tense like a cornered animal. You don't understand what you're getting into, officer, he said, his voice hoarse. These people, they'll destroy anyone who threatens them. Terence slowly holstered his weapon. I've seen your case file, the inconsistencies, the sealed records. Something's not right there. The assault charge was fabricated, Marcus said bitterly. I was a maintenance worker at the precinct. I found documents, evidence of money laundering, evidence tampering. When they realized I'd seen too much, they came after me. Lily grabbed her father's arm. Show him the papers, Dad. He can help us. Marcus shook his head. No, I can't risk it. Not yet. He looked at Terence with hard eyes. If you're really on our side, prove it. But watch your back. They've got eyes everywhere. At least tell me who they are, Terence pressed. You'll figure it out soon enough. Marcus pulled away from Lily, backing toward the shadows. Just keep my daughter safe. Before Terence could respond, Marcus melted into the darkness between houses, leaving only questions in his wake. Lily stood beside Terence, 
both watching the spot where Marcus had disappeared. He's been running for so long, Lily whispered. Sometimes I think it's breaking him. Terence nodded silently, his mind racing with the implications of Marcus's words. The corruption he'd always suspected went deeper than he'd imagined, and now he was caught in the middle of it. Morning sunlight streamed through the coffee shop's grimy windows as Terence stared into his untouched cup. The bitter aroma couldn't shake the unease settling in his stomach. His notepad lay open before him, filled with scribbled details from last night's encounter with Marcus. Evidence of money laundering, he muttered, underlining the words. His pen tapped against the paper as memories of Marcus's haunted expression played through his mind. Years on the force had taught Terence to read people, and everything about Marcus's demeanor spoke of a man running from something real, not imagined. After finishing his cold coffee, Terence drove to Lily's house. The morning light revealed peeling paint and loose shutters he hadn't noticed in the darkness. Lily answered his knock quickly, as if she'd been waiting for him. Is he here? Terence asked quietly. Lily shook her head. He never stays long. Says it's safer that way. They sat at the kitchen table where Helen dozed in a worn armchair nearby. Terence leaned forward keeping his voice low. Listen, Lily, I need you to understand something. Harboring a fugitive is serious. You could get in real trouble. Are you going to arrest him? Her eyes narrowed, hands clenching into fists on the table. Not yet, Terence said carefully, but I need to know more. These documents he mentioned. He says they'll bring down everyone involved, Lily interrupted. He keeps them hidden, moves them around, Says if the wrong people find them, we'll all be in danger. She glanced at her sleeping grandmother. He's trying to protect us, not hurt us. Tarrant studied the young girl's face, seeing beyond her tough exterior to the weight she carried. Every day brought new fears, of police, of discovery, of losing what little family she had left. I believe you, he said finally. But you need to be careful. Don't talk to anyone about this. Don't act suspicious. Just go about your normal routine. Relief flooded Lily's features. So you'll help? You'll look into what Dad found? I'll investigate. Terence nodded. But Lily, stay safe. Keep your head down. And if you need anything, you call me first. Understand? Lily nodded, her shoulders relaxing slightly. For the first time... Terence saw a glimmer of hope in her eyes. Terence sat in the dimly lit records room, surrounded by stacks of manila folders. The precinct had quieted as the day shift wound down, leaving him alone with the hum of fluorescent lights and the rustle of paper. His fingers traced over case numbers, methodically connecting dots that had been hidden in plain sight. A pattern emerged from the seemingly random gang-related arrests. The same officers' names appeared repeatedly. Rodriguez, Matthews, and most notably, Detective Daniel Sykes. Their cases shared unusual similarities. Gang members arrested on minor charges, then released with surprisingly light sentences. This doesn't add up, Terence muttered, spreading the files across the desk. He noticed how the surge in gang activity perfectly aligned with these arrests. The timing was too convenient to be coincidental. One particular case caught his attention. A known drug dealer, caught with a significant amount of product, walked free on a technicality. The arresting officer? Detective Sykes. The paperwork showed multiple procedural errors that seemed deliberate rather than careless. Terence pulled up Sykes's personnel file on the computer. The detective's record appeared spotless. Commendations, rapid promotions, and an impressive solve rate. But something felt off about the perfectly polished image. Cross-referencing dates, Terence discovered that Marcus's last known appearance at the precinct coincided with several of these suspicious cases. He had worked in records management back then, perfectly positioned to notice irregularities in the paperwork. The documents Marcus mentioned, Terence whispered, pieces clicking into place. He must have found proof of kickbacks or payoffs. The more he dug, the clearer the picture became. Gang territories expanded in areas where certain officers patrolled. 
drug busts resulted in confiscated product that never made it to evidence lockup. Large sums of money appeared in sealed records, then vanished without explanation. Detective Sykes's name wove through it all like a dark thread, connecting seemingly unrelated cases. His signature appeared on warrant requests, evidence transfers, and case closures that now looked suspicious under scrutiny. Terence's heart raced as he realized the scope of what he was uncovering. This wasn't just about a few corrupt cops taking bribes. This was systematic, a carefully orchestrated operation using police authority as cover for criminal activities. Footsteps in the hallway made him freeze. Quickly but carefully, he returned the files to their proper places, making sure everything looked undisturbed. He logged out of the computer system, his pulse pounding in his ears. As he left the records room, the weight of his discoveries pressed down on him. He now understood why Marcus had gone into hiding. The evidence he possessed could expose years of corruption and the powerful people behind it. The streetlights cast long shadows across Lincoln Heights as Terrence cruised through the familiar streets in his patrol car. His mind raced with the connections he'd uncovered, the suspicious arrests, the pattern of corruption and Detective Sykes' involvement. The evening air felt heavy with tension. Something in his rearview mirror caught his attention. A dark sedan, about three car lengths back, had been matching his turns for the past ten minutes. Terence's neck tightened as his police instincts kicked in. Let's see if this is what I think it is, he muttered, deliberately taking a right turn onto Cedar Street, a narrow road lined with abandoned warehouses. The sedan followed, maintaining the same careful distance. Terence's heart rate picked up. He took another turn, this time onto a barely used side street. Again, the car followed. His palms grew sweaty on the steering wheel as he navigated through the maze of Lincoln Heights back streets, the headlights behind him never wavering. Through his side mirror, Terence tried to make out the driver, but the car's windows were tinted too dark. The streetlights reflected off the windshield, making it impossible to see inside. He recognized the model. A late model Chrysler, black or dark blue, no distinguishing marks. Making a split-second decision, Terence cut down an alley he knew well a shortcut that only locals used. The sedan stayed with him, closer now. The message was clear. This was no coincidence. Just as Terence prepared to radio for backup, the sedan's engine roared. It accelerated suddenly, passing his patrol car with inches to spare before speeding off into the night. The aggressive move left no doubt. This was a warning. Terence pulled over, his hands shaking slightly as he put the car in park. The empty street stretched before him, the sedan long gone. He took several deep breaths, trying to steady his nerves. This was real now. Someone knew he was investigating and they wanted him to know they were watching. With trembling fingers, he pulled out his phone and typed a message to Lily. Need to meet with your dad. Important. Soon. He hit send, knowing there was no turning back now. The stakes had just gotten much higher but he couldn't walk away, not when he was this close to uncovering the truth. The quiet of the empty street felt oppressive as Terence sat there, waiting for Lily's response. He was in deep now, deeper than he'd ever intended to go. But with corruption reaching into his own department and Marcus's life on the line, he had no choice but to see this through. The afternoon sun beat down on the empty parking lot as Terence pulled in, gravel crunching under his tires. He parked behind a rusted shipping container that blocked the view from the street. Marcus emerged from behind it, his shoulders tense and eyes darting around constantly. Thanks for coming, Marcus said, his voice low and rough. Dark circles under his eyes spoke of sleepless nights, and his clothes looked worn and wrinkled. I've been moving this thing from place to place for three years now. He reached into his jacket and pulled out an old digital voice recorder, the kind reporters used to carry. The black plastic was scratched and the display was cracked, but a small green light indicated it still worked. This is the only piece of proof I've managed to keep safe, Marcus said, holding it out to Terence with a slightly trembling hand. Terence took the device carefully, examining it. What's on it? Press play, you need to hear it yourself. The recording crackled to life. Two male voices emerged through the static, their conversation clearly not meant for others to hear. 
The payments need to keep flowing, the first voice said. Terence's stomach tightened. He recognized Detective Sykes's distinctive drawl. We can't afford any loose ends. I've got the paperwork covered, another voice responded. No one's going to trace anything back to us. They better not. Make sure... The recording cut off abruptly. That's all? Terence asked, frustration evident in his voice. Marcus nodded grimly. The battery died right then, but I have more. Documents, photos, other recordings. I've got them hidden away. I just need time to get to them safely. The other voice, Terence said, rewinding the recording slightly. Who is it? Officer James Miller. He handles most of their paperwork. Make sure everything looks clean on the surface. Terence handed the recorder back, his mind racing with the implications. These men are dangerous, Marcus. If they find out you have this... I know, Marcus replied, tucking the device away. Why do you think I've been running for so long? But I can't keep running forever. Not with Lily involved. Be careful, Terence warned. They won't hesitate to retaliate if they feel exposed. The morning sun had barely risen when Terence's phone buzzed with Lily's panicked call. She's gone! I can't find Grandma Helen anywhere! Lily's voice cracked with fear. Terence rushed to their house, finding Lily on the front porch, her face pale with worry. I just went to make her breakfast and she wasn't in her room, she explained, wringing her hands. They split up to search the neighborhood, with Terence checking the south side while Lily took the north. He peered into shop windows and asked the early morning regulars if they'd seen an elderly woman wandering alone. The worry in his chest grew with each empty street. After an hour of searching, Lily called again. The park. I found her at Jefferson Park. Terence jogged to the small neighborhood park where he found Helen sitting alone on a wooden bench, talking softly to herself. Lily stood nearby, relief evident on her face. Those men from the station, Helen muttered as they approached. They don't know Marcus has the papers. He's hiding the truth, you see. Terence knelt beside the bench. Helen, what papers is Marcus hiding? Helen's eyes, usually clouded with confusion, suddenly focused on Terence. The papers show everything. Marcus took them before they could. She trailed off, her gaze becoming distant again. But they're looking. Always looking. Grandma... Lily said gently, touching Helen's arm. Let's get you home. But Helen became agitated, her hands fluttering like startled birds. No, no, you don't understand. The men in uniforms, they're not what they seem. Marcus knows. He knows what they did. Lily sat beside her grandmother, wrapping an arm around her thin shoulders. It's okay, Grandma. You're safe. We're here. They carefully helped Helen to her feet and walked her home, supporting her on each side. Once inside, Lily helped her grandmother settle into her favorite armchair, where Helen quickly dozed off, exhausted from her morning adventure. Lily collapsed onto the couch, tears welling in her eyes. I can't lose them both, she whispered, her voice breaking. Dad's out there somewhere, maybe in danger, and Grandma... She's slipping away more each day. I don't know what to do anymore. Terence sat beside her, watching Helen sleep peacefully in her chair. The morning's events had left them all drained, but Helen's cryptic words echoed in his mind, adding another piece to the growing puzzle. Back at the precinct, Terence sat in the dimly lit records room, surrounded by stacks of files. Helen's words about papers echoed in his mind as he cross-referenced cases involving Marcus Parker with those mentioning Detective Sykes. His eyes burned from hours of reading, but then something caught his attention. A report from three years ago detailed a routine inspection at Johnson's Auto Shop, the same day Marcus disappeared. The shop owner, Frank Johnson, had been arrested on minor violations, but the charges were mysteriously dropped. Sykes's signature was on the paperwork. What were you really looking for that day, Marcus? Terence muttered, pulling up more files. A pattern emerged like a photograph developing in dark room. Johnson's auto shop appeared in multiple reports, always with minimal charges that were later dismissed. The shop's bank records showed large deposits from companies Terence recognized as gang fronts. His heart pounded as he discovered more connections. 
three other businesses in the same neighborhood, a laundromat, a convenience store, and a small accounting firm, all had similar patterns. Large cash deposits, minor violations, dropped charges, and Sykes's name appearing on the paperwork. Then he found it, a witness statement buried in an old case file. Marcus Parker, listed as an accountant who occasionally helped with bookkeeping at Johnson's Auto Shop. The statement was incomplete, marked as withdrawn, but it was enough. Marcus must have seen something in those books, something that exposed the whole operation. Terence leaned back in his chair, the pieces finally clicking into place. The auto shop and other businesses weren't just regular storefronts. They were laundering money for local gangs. Sykes wasn't just a corrupt cop taking bribes. He was protecting an entire network of criminal enterprises. The realization hit him hard. Marcus Parker wasn't some criminal seeking revenge. He was an ordinary man who had stumbled onto something much bigger than himself, and they'd tried to silence him by any means necessary. Flipping through his notes, Terence saw tomorrow's schedule included a mandatory precinct meeting. Sykes would be there, probably sitting in his usual spot near the front, commanding respect from officers who had no idea what he really was. Terence carefully replaced the files and cleared his search history from the computer. He knew what he had to do next, attend that meeting and observe Sykes closely but carefully. One wrong move could alert the detective that someone was onto him. The precinct meeting room buzzed with low conversation as officers filed in, their badges gleaming under the fluorescent lights. Terence chose a seat near the back, his notepad ready as a prop. He watched Detective Sykes stride to the front of the room, commanding attention with his presence alone. Evening, everyone, Sykes began, his voice smooth and controlled. Let's get started with recent developments in the Lincoln Heights area. As Sykes discussed crime statistics and patrol schedules, Terence noticed Officer Martinez and Sergeant Brooks exchanging subtle glances whenever certain locations were mentioned, particularly areas near Johnson's auto shop. Their body language spoke volumes about shared secrets. Officer Lewis, Sykes called out suddenly, his eyes fixed on Terence. You've been spending a lot of time in Lincoln Heights lately. Anything noteworthy to share? Terence kept his expression neutral, though his heart raced. Just the usual, sir. Some concerns about youth loitering, but nothing major. Been trying to build community trust through regular presence. Community trust, Sykes repeated, a hint of mockery in his tone. Always the Boy Scout, aren't you, Lewis? Several officers chuckled, and Terence noticed Officer Rodriguez shifting uncomfortably in his seat. Another tell. Just doing my job, sir, Terence replied evenly. Throughout the meeting, Terence felt eyes on him. Every time he looked up, someone quickly glanced away. The tension in the room was thick enough to cut with a knife. After discussing upcoming operations, Sykes wrapped up the meeting. As officers began to file out, he approached Terence. A word? Sykes's tone was friendly, but his eyes were cold. They stepped into the hallway away from others. Sykes placed a firm hand on Terence's shoulder, squeezing slightly harder than necessary. You're a good officer, Lewis. Sykes said quietly, smart, dedicated, but sometimes smart people forget their place. They start poking around where they shouldn't. That usually doesn't end well for them. Terence maintained his calm facade. Not sure I follow, sir. Let me be clearer then. Sykes's grip tightened. Stay in your lane. Focus on writing tickets and breaking up street fights. Don't overstep your bounds. Understood? Yes, sir. Terence replied, his voice steady despite the threat hanging in the air. Sykes released his shoulder and walked away, leaving Terence alone in the hallway, the warning ringing in his ears. The morning sun had barely risen when Lily's scream pierced through the quiet house. Her hands trembled as she held the wrinkled piece of paper she'd found slipped under their front door. The crude message written in thick black marker made her stomach churn. Keep quiet, or else... She fumbled with her phone, calling Terence with shaking fingers. Someone left a note, she whispered, her voice cracking. I'm scared. Terence arrived within minutes, still in his civilian clothes. He carefully picked up the note using a tissue, examining the aggressive strokes of the letters. This looks rushed, angry, he said, his jaw tight. 
Probably one of Sykes's people trying to intimidate you. Lily hugged herself, glancing at Helen who sat in her favorite chair, peacefully unaware as she worked on a crossword puzzle. What do we do? I know someone trustworthy, Mrs. Thompson from my church. She has a spare room and would be happy to host you and your grandmother for a few days. Terence placed a gentle hand on Lily's shoulder. Just until we sort this out. The back door suddenly creaked open, making them both jump. Marcus slipped in, his face dark with rage. I saw the note, he growled, holding up his phone with a photo of the threat. They're getting desperate. They know we're close. Dad, please. Lily started, but Marcus cut her off. We don't have time anymore, he insisted, pacing the small kitchen. I'm so close to getting the rest of the evidence. The documents that'll prove everything. The kickbacks, the frame-ups, all of it. Terence stepped between father and daughter. Marcus, think about Lily's safety. Let me get them somewhere secure first. Marcus ran his hands through his disheveled hair, his anger giving way to fear. You don't understand. If they're sending threats now, it means they know how much we know. All the more reason to move Lily and Helen somewhere safe, Terence insisted. Mrs. Thompson's place is in a different district. They won't think to look there. After a tense moment, Marcus nodded. Fine, but there's a place we need to check tonight. I've got documentation hidden. Stuff that'll blow this whole thing wide open. I'll go with you, Terence offered, keeping his voice low as Helen hummed to herself in the next room. But first, let's get your family somewhere safe. The evening air hung heavy with tension as Terence's unmarked car pulled up to the abandoned warehouse. Its weathered walls loomed against the darkening sky, windows broken and boarded up like hollow eyes. Marcus sat rigid in the passenger seat, his fingers drumming nervously on his knee. This is it, Marcus whispered, scanning the area. I've been keeping the documents here for months, right under their noses. They slipped inside through a rusted side door, flashlight beams cutting through the musty darkness. Their footsteps echoed off concrete floors covered in years of dust and debris. Marcus led them past forgotten machinery and empty shipping crates, counting his steps carefully. Here, he said, stopping at what looked like an ordinary section of wall. He pried loose a panel, revealing a metal box wedged deep in the cavity. Everything I gathered is in here. Bank statements, photos, meeting records. Just as Marcus pulled the box free, a faint electronic chirp echoed through the warehouse. Both men froze. Marcus's face went pale. That's not possible, he breathed. They must have installed sensors after my last visit. Within minutes, heavy footsteps approached from outside. Two men burst through the door, weapons raised. Don't move, one shouted. Hand over the box. Terence's police training kicked in. In one fluid motion, he shoved Marcus behind a large crate while drawing his service weapon. Police, drop your weapons. Gunfire erupted, bullets pinging off metal surfaces. Marcus clutched the box to his chest as they scrambled between machinery, looking for an exit. Terence provided cover fire, forcing their attackers to take shelter. The back door, Marcus hissed, pointing to a barely visible exit. They made a break for it, but Marcus stumbled. The box flew from his hands, scattering papers across the floor. He managed to grab a handful of documents before Terence yanked him to his feet. Leave it, Terence commanded as Marcus tried to go back for more. We need to move. They burst through the exit into the cool night air, running until they reached Terence's car. Tires squealed as they sped away, hearts pounding. Several blocks later, Marcus slumped in his seat, staring at the few papers he'd managed to save. All that work, he said, voice breaking. Half the evidence is still back there. We got something, Terence replied firmly, gripping the steering wheel. That's what matters. Whatever you saved, we'll make it count. The morning sun filtered through the grimy windows of Pete's diner, casting long shadows across the cracked vinyl booths. Terence sat in a corner booth, his coffee untouched, watching the door. When Anita Reyes walked in, her press badge hanging from a lanyard around her neck, he recognized her immediately from her byline photos. Officer Lewis? She asked quietly, sliding into the booth. Before Terence could respond, Marcus emerged from the restroom and quickly sat down beside him. Terence tensed. Marcus, I told you to wait. 
I need to be here, Marcus insisted, his voice low but firm. These are my documents, my story. Anita's eyebrows rose, but she maintained her professional composure. Mr. Parker, I presume? They spent the next hour going through the evidence. Anita took careful notes as Terrence explained the connections between Detective Sykes, the gang operations, and Marcus's framing. Her dark eyes narrowed as she examined the documents, occasionally nodding. This is explosive stuff, she said finally. But we'll need more concrete proof to go public. These documents alone won't... The diner's bell chimed. Two uniformed officers walked in, their hands resting too casually on their holsters. Terence recognized them immediately, Officers Johnson and Rivera, both known to be close to Sykes. Time to go, Terence muttered, but it was too late. The officers moved quickly, blocking their exit. Well, well, Johnson sneered. Look who we found. What happened next unfolded in seconds. As Johnson reached for his cuffs, Marcus shoved the table forward, creating space. Rivera lunged, but Marcus deflected the grab, pushing Terence and Anita toward the kitchen's back exit. Run! Marcus shouted, blocking the officer's path. Johnson swung his baton, but Marcus caught it, twisting it away. Rivera reached for his radio. Assault in progress. Officer down. Suspect Marcus Parker. Marcus landed a defensive strike, giving them the precious seconds needed to escape. Through the kitchen they ran, past startled cooks and out the back door into the alley. Behind them, they could hear Johnson calling for backup. His voice twisted with false pain. Suspect attacked officers. Use extreme caution. Anita clutched her notebook, breathing hard. I'll get started on the story right away, but you both need to disappear. They'll use this to hunt you down. Marcus nodded grimly. Nothing new there. He turned to Terence. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have come. We'll fix this, Terence promised. But Marcus was already melting into the shadows of the alley, leaving Terence and Anita to watch as sirens began wailing in the distance. Lily sat cross-legged on the living room floor, surrounded by scattered photographs. The afternoon light streamed through dusty curtains as she sorted through memories with Helen, who dozed in her worn armchair nearby. Look at this one, Grandma, Lily said softly, holding up a faded photo of a birthday party. Helen smiled vaguely, but her eyes remained distant. As Lily dug deeper into the box, her hand brushed against something stuck to the bottom. She pulled out a creased photograph, its edges worn. Her father, Marcus, looked younger and more carefree, standing proudly in front of a police precinct. Next to him stood another officer, their arms thrown casually over each other's shoulders like old friends. Grandma, who's this with Dad? Lily asked, but Helen had fallen asleep. When Terrence arrived later that afternoon, Lily practically pulled him through the door. You need to see this, she said, thrusting the photograph into his hands. Terrence's eyes widened as he studied the image. That's Detective Sykes, he said quietly. Your father knew him? As if summoned by their conversation, Marcus appeared from the kitchen. His face darkened when he saw the photograph. Danny and I were friends once, he said, his voice heavy with regret. We went through the academy together. Used to have cookouts, our families were close. What happened? Terence asked. Marcus leaned against the wall, running a hand over his tired face. I was working late one night, filing reports. Found some paperwork I wasn't supposed to see. Gang arrests that didn't add up, money moving where it shouldn't. When I confronted Danny about it, he shook his head. He tried to buy my silence at first. When that didn't work, the threats started. Lily clutched the photograph tighter. Why didn't you ever tell me? To protect you, sweetheart, the less you knew, the safer you'd be. Marcus turned to Terence. Danny won't stop. He's got too much to lose. He'll destroy everything and anyone who threatens to expose him. In a dimly lit basement apartment across town, Terence, Marcus, and Anita gathered around a small kitchen table. Coffee cups and scattered papers covered its surface. The afternoon sun barely penetrated through the tiny ground-level windows. I need to be there, Marcus insisted, his hands pressed flat against the table. People need to hear it from me. See my face. No, I'm not just some criminal running from the law. Terence rubbed his temples. It's dangerous, Marcus. Sykes and his people will be watching. 
But he's right, Anita chimed in, adjusting her reading glasses as she reviewed their evidence. A face-to-face -face testimony carries more weight than just documents. The community needs to see the human cost of this corruption. Marcus nodded gratefully at Anita. Exactly. Plus that old photo of me and Sykes together. It proves our connection. Shows I'm not making this up. I can start releasing pieces of the story tomorrow, Anita said, making notes in her small notebook. Nothing too specific, just enough to get people talking. Build anticipation for the hearing. Terence paced the small room. The moment you start publishing, they'll know what's coming. They might try to stop us before we even get to the hearing. Then let them try, Marcus said firmly. I'm tired of hiding. Tired of Lily having to live like this. Helen getting worse. His voice cracked slightly. This might be our only shot. Anita spread out the documents they'd recovered from the warehouse. These financial records, combined with the recording and the photograph, it's compelling evidence. The community will listen. And if Sykes sends his people after you? Terence asked, stopping his pacing to look directly at Marcus. That's why I need you there, Marcus replied quietly. You're the only cop I trust anymore. Terence sat back down at the table, studying the determined faces before him. Despite his reservations, he knew they were right. This was their chance to expose everything. The corruption, the gang connections, the frame-up of Marcus. Okay, he said finally. But we do this smart. Anita, when you release the initial story, keep Marcus's name out of it. Focus on the corruption angle. And Marcus, you stay hidden until the actual hearing. No risks before then. They spent the next hour working out the details. Timing, security, backup plans. As the meeting wrapped up, Terence watched Marcus gathering the evidence with trembling hands. Despite his brave words, the man was scared, and he had every right to be. I'll protect you, Terence promised quietly. Whatever it takes, we're going to make this right. Marcus looked up, his eyes filled with both fear and determination. I know you will. That's why I trusted you with Lily in the first place. The community center buzzed with nervous energy as people filed into the large meeting room. Terence and Marcus arrived an hour early, slipping in through a side entrance. They carefully arranged their evidence on a folding table near the podium, the photograph, financial records, and the recording device. You sure about this? Terence asked quietly, noticing Marcus's hands trembling slightly. Never been more sure, Marcus replied, though his voice wavered. Lily and Helen deserve better than living in fear. As community members filled the rows of chairs, Terence spotted three officers he knew were loyal to Sykes. They lounged near the back wall, trying to look casual, but watching the room with predatory focus. One of them, Officer Jenkins, caught Terence's eye and smirked. They're here, Terence muttered to Marcus, stay alert. The room grew more crowded, filled with concerned citizens who had read Anita's initial reports about police corruption. Anita herself sat in the front row, camera ready, notebook open. The tension in the air was thick enough to cut with a knife. Marcus stepped toward the podium, papers clutched in his hands. The fluorescent lights cast harsh shadows across his determined face. He opened his mouth to speak, but before any words came out, a sharp crack split the air. Marcus stumbled backward, red blooming across his chest. Screams erupted as people dove for cover. Terence lunged toward Marcus, but was suddenly tackled from behind. His face slammed into the linoleum floor as someone roughly cuffed his hands behind his back. Officer Terence Lewis, you're under arrest for conspiracy to commit murder. Jenkins' voice growled in his ear. What? No! Terence struggled against the cuffs. He needs help. Marcus needs help. Through the chaos, he could see Marcus being lifted onto a stretcher, paramedics working frantically. Anita was snapping photos rapid fire her face pale but determined. The evidence lay scattered across the floor, some papers stained with Marcus's blood. As they dragged him toward the exit, Terence heard Jenkins radio in. Suspect apprehended. Officer Lewis is in custody for orchestrating the attack on Marcus Parker. The last thing Terence saw before they pushed him through the doors was Anita's fierce expression as she documented everything, her camera flashing like silent promises in the chaos. The holding cell's harsh fluorescent light flickered overhead, casting strange shadows on the concrete walls. 
Terence sat on the hard metal bench, his police badge and belt confiscated, leaving him feeling exposed and vulnerable. The cold seeped through his thin uniform shirt, but the chill in his bones came from something deeper, the stark reality of how far Sykes's corruption reached. All this time, he muttered to himself, running his hands over his face. They were ready for everything. The sound of footsteps echoing down the corridor pulled him from his thoughts. A guard appeared, jingling his keys. Your phone call, the guard said gruffly. At the wall-mounted phone, Terence's fingers trembled slightly as he dialed Anita's number. She answered on the first ring. Terence, thank God, are you okay? I'm holding up, he replied, keeping his voice low. Marcus? Anita sighed heavily. He's in the ICU. The bullet missed his heart but did some serious damage. He's stable but critical. They've got him sedated. He can't speak yet. Terence closed his eyes, letting out a shaky breath. At least he's alive. Listen, Anita, I need... I'm already on it, she cut in. I've got photos of everything. The shooting, the officers who arrested you, the evidence getting scattered. And I believe you, Terence. We all saw who really orchestrated this. Be careful, Terence warned. Sykes has eyes everywhere. I know. But I've got sources too and I'm not stopping until we expose this. The truth matters more than their threats. Terence pressed his forehead against the cold wall. Thank you, Anita. I just need time to figure out my next move. You focus on staying safe in there. I'll keep digging out here. Her voice softened. We'll get through this, Terence. Justice is still possible. As the guard signaled his time was up, Terence gripped the phone tighter. Keep an eye on Lily and Helen for me. Already arranged safe housing for them, don't worry. Back in his cell, Terence sat straight-backed on the bench. His mind raced through possible allies at the precinct, officers who might help clear his name. He wasn't finished yet, not while Marcus fought for his life and the truth remained buried. Marcus's eyes fluttered open in the sterile hospital room, the steady beep of monitors marking each labored breath. Through waves of pain and medication-induced fog, he focused on the sympathetic face of Sarah, the night shift nurse who had been caring for him since his admission. Paper, he whispered hoarsely. Please, need to write. Sarah hesitated, glancing at the door before pulling a small notepad from her pocket. You shouldn't be exerting yourself, Mr. Parker. Marcus's trembling hand grasped the pen she offered. No time, have to. His writing was shaky but determined as he filled several pages with names, dates, and locations. There's a reporter, he managed between labored breaths. Anita Reyes. She needs this. He folded the pages carefully, his fingers weak but precise. Sarah took the folded paper, tucking it into her uniform pocket. I'll make sure she gets it, she promised, understanding in her eyes. But you need to rest now. Within the hour, Anita sat in her car outside the hospital. Marcus's note spread across her steering wheel. Her eyes widened as she read through the detailed account of Sykes's operation. The laundered money flowing through seemingly legitimate businesses. The names of gang leaders working with corrupt officers the exact dates of key meetings and transactions. This is everything we needed, she whispered, her hands trembling slightly as she reached the final page. At the bottom, Marcus had scrawled a desperate plea. Clear Terence's name. He risked everything to help expose this. Anita pulled out her laptop, fingers flying across the keyboard as she began crafting the story that would shake the department to its core. Each piece of evidence now had context, each connection was clearly mapped out. Marcus's account filled in the gaps they'd been missing, transforming scattered pieces into a complete picture of corruption that reached the highest levels of the precinct. The morning sun cast long shadows across Lincoln Heights as newsstands filled with the day's explosive headline, Corruption Exposed, Police Officers Linked to Gang Operations. Anita's article, prominently featuring the damning photograph of Sykes and Marcus, spread like wildfire through social media and news channels. This corruption has destroyed lives and betrayed public trust, Anita wrote in her opening paragraph. The article meticulously detailed the money laundering scheme, 
backed by Marcus's handwritten testimony and corroborating evidence. Each revelation hit the community like a thunderbolt. By mid-morning, a crowd had gathered outside the precinct. What started as a dozen concerned citizens swelled to hundreds, their voices rising in unified chants. Justice for Marcus. Free Terrence Lewis. Inside the precinct, the atmosphere crackled with tension. Officer Jenny Martinez, a rookie who had witnessed suspicious activities but stayed quiet out of fear, approached internal affairs with trembling hands. I have something to add, she said, placing a folder on the desk. Other officers followed suit, each bringing forward small pieces of evidence they'd previously been too afraid to share. Sykes paced in his office, phone pressed to his ear. It's all lies, he insisted to reporters. Parker is a criminal trying to smear honest police work. But his usual confidence wavered as more evidence emerged. His attempts to discredit Anita's reporting fell flat against the weight of documentation and testimony. The protesters outside grew more organized, holding signs with Marcus's photo and Terrence's badge number. Community leaders took turns speaking through megaphones, demanding accountability and reform. In his holding cell, Terrence sat on the narrow bed, listening to the muffled chants filtering through the walls. Each voice represented hope. Hope that truth could prevail over corruption, that justice could still mean something in Lincoln Heights. Free Terrence Lewis! The chant grew louder, clearer. A small smile crossed Terrence's face as he recognized Anita's voice among the crowd, still fighting, still pushing for truth. Two internal affairs officers, Thompson and Rivera, stood outside Terrence's cell, their faces stern but tired. Thompson spoke first, his voice low and measured. Officer Lewis, we're prepared to offer you a deal. Help us wrap this up quickly and we can make things easier for you. Terrence sat up straight on his hard prison cot, looking them directly in the eyes. I won't make deals. The evidence is all there in Anita's article. That's what you should be investigating. Rivera stepped closer to the bars. This could mean your career, Lewis. Think about what you're doing. I have thought about it, Terrence replied firmly. Every piece of evidence we gathered tells the real story. Check the financial records. Look into Sykes's connections. That's your job. Across town, Anita Reyes hunched over her laptop in her dimly lit office. Her tech expert, Jamie, had just cracked an encrypted file from Marcus's evidence cache. Numbers filled the screen. Dates, amounts, and names carefully documented. Look at this, Jamie pointed to a series of transactions. These payments align perfectly with major gang activity in Lincoln Heights, and they all trace back to accounts connected to Sykes. Anita's eyes widened as she scrolled through the data. This is it. The smoking gun we needed. Outside the precinct, the crowd of protesters had grown larger, their chants echoing through the streets. No more corruption. We demand the truth. Inside the Internal Affairs Office, Director Chen reviewed the mounting evidence with growing concern. Financial records, witness statements, and corrupted case files painted an increasingly damning picture of Detective Sykes's activities. Officer Martinez knocked on Terrence's cell later that evening. She glanced nervously down the hallway before whispering, They're investigating Sykes now. Really investigating. Internal Affairs has been in their office all day going through everything. Terrence nodded slowly, relief washing over his face. Finally, the truth was coming to light. The community center buzzed with tension as people packed into every available seat. Anita Reyes stood at the podium, her posture straight, but her eyes tired from sleepless nights of investigation. She adjusted the microphone and pressed play on the recording device. Marcus's voice, weak but determined, filled the room. I was working late that night, doing maintenance at the precinct. That's when I saw them. Sykes and his crew, meeting with known gang leaders in the parking lot. I wouldn't have thought much of it except I saw money changing hands. The crowd sat in stunned silence as Marcus detailed dates, amounts, and names. His voice trembled as he described how his life unraveled after discovering the truth. They tried to frame me, threatened my family. I couldn't let them hurt Lily or Helen, but I couldn't let them keep hurting our community either. Anita then displayed financial records on the projection screen behind her. 
These documents show systematic payments from accounts linked to Detective Sykes to known gang operations in Lincoln Heights. The dates correspond exactly with increased criminal activity in our neighborhoods. Gasps and murmurs rippled through the audience. Several internal affairs officers stood at the back of the room, their faces grim as they took notes. Captain Rodriguez from Internal Affairs stepped forward. In light of this evidence effective immediately, Detective Daniel Sykes and Officers Thompson, Martinez, and Wilson are suspended pending a full investigation. The announcement sparked a wave of applause and shouts for justice. People stood, some crying, others hugging their neighbors. A woman in the front row held up a sign reading, Thank you, Marcus Parker, true hero. After the forum, Anita visited Marcus in his hospital room. The steady beep of monitors filled the silence as she approached his bed. His face was pale, tubes and wires connecting him to various machines. We did it, Marcus, she said softly, touching his hand. People know the truth now. They're calling you a hero. Marcus's eyes fluttered open briefly. He managed a weak nod, his hand barely squeezing hers in response. Anita watched his chest rise and fall with labored breaths, uncertain if he would survive to see justice fully served. Terence sat in the stark internal affairs interview room, his hands folded calmly on the metal table. The past week's events had aged him, but determination burned in his eyes. Two investigators sat across from him, their expressions carefully neutral. Officer Lewis, the senior investigator began, please walk us through your involvement in this case. Terence spoke clearly and methodically, laying out each piece of evidence. He described his first encounters with Lily, his growing suspicions about Marcus's case, and the pattern of corruption he'd uncovered. Anita had provided him with additional documents which now lay spread across the table. These financial records, Terence explained, pointing to a stack of papers, show regular payments from shell companies linked to Detective Sykes. They align perfectly with increased gang activity in Lincoln Heights. Throughout the precinct, the atmosphere was shifting. Officers who had once been loyal to Sykes began coming forward, their confessions adding weight to Terence's testimony. One detective admitted to falsifying evidence in gang-related cases. Another revealed how Sykes had orchestrated protection rackets under the guise of community policing. The evidence was overwhelming. Internal affairs cross-referenced everything with Anita's published expose and Marcus's testimony. The pieces fit together like a perfect puzzle, revealing the full scope of Sykes's corruption. By afternoon, Sykes was formally charged with multiple counts of corruption conspiracy, and the attempted murder of Marcus Parker. His network, built on threats and payoffs, crumbled as more officers sought deals to save themselves. Officer Lewis, the senior investigator said, closing his notebook, you're free to go. Internal Affairs extends its formal apology for your detention. As Terrence walked out of the precinct, he saw Sykes being led away in handcuffs. A crowd had gathered, their angry voices rising as the fallen detective passed. Sykes kept his head down, his once proud posture now broken under the weight of his crimes. Terence pulled up to the Parker house, now flanked by two patrol cars. The officers nodded respectfully as he approached the front door. The peeling paint and sagging steps remained the same, but something felt different. Safer, perhaps. Helen opened the door before he could knock, her eyes clear and focused. Officer Lewis, she said warmly, reaching for his hand. Please. Come in. We've been waiting for you. Inside, Lily sat at the kitchen table, her usual defensive posture noticeably absent. When she saw Terence, her lower lip trembled. I'm so sorry, she blurted out. When they arrested you, I thought maybe everyone was right about cops. I should have known better. Terence sat down across from her. You had every reason to be cautious, Lily. Trust has to be earned. Helen brought over a pot of tea, her movements steady. You were sent to us, she said, patting Terence's shoulder. A guardian, watching over this family when we needed it most. Lily reached under the table and pulled out a thick scrapbook. I've been putting this together, she explained, opening it carefully. Everything Dad did, everything he fought for. Look. The pages were filled with newspaper clippings, photographs, and handwritten notes. Lily had documented Marcus's journey meticulously, 
from his first discovery of corruption to his current fight for justice. I want to keep going, Lily said firmly. Dad showed me that one person can make a difference. I want to work for police reform, make sure other families don't go through what we did. Helen squeezed her granddaughter's hand. Marcus would be so proud of you, sweetheart. I'll help however I can, Terence promised, looking through the scrapbook. There are good officers who want change, too. You won't be alone in this fight. You protected us, Helen said softly. Even when it cost you everything. That's what Marcus tried to do, too. Lily wiped away tears. Will you help me? I want to do this right. Make real change happen. Of course, Terence replied. I know people who can guide you, help you make your voice heard. The community center buzzed with anticipation as people filled every available seat. Handmade signs reading Parker's Promise decorated the walls, alongside photos of Marcus and newspaper clippings about police reform. Lily stood at the podium, her hands steady despite her nerves. Welcome to the first meeting of Parker's Promise, she began, her voice clear and strong. My father risked everything to expose corruption and fight for justice. Today, we continue his work. Terence watched from the side of the stage, amazed at her composure. The crowd included familiar faces from the neighborhood, several officers he trusted, and even some city officials. Helen sat in the front row, beaming with pride. When it was his turn to speak, Terence approached the podium. I've worn this badge for years, he said, touching his uniform. But it was Marcus Parker who taught me what true courage looks like. He didn't just expose corruption. He showed us that change is possible when we stand together. The audience nodded in agreement. Some wiped away tears as Terence described Marcus's sacrifice and determination. We need accountability, he continued. But we also need to recognize the officers who choose to do what's right, even when it's hard. Marcus proved that one person's bravery can inspire others to step forward. Several officers in attendance stood up, showing their support. Lily returned to the podium, standing tall beside Terence. This is just the beginning, she declared. Parker's promise will work with our community and honest officers to create real change. We'll honor my father's legacy by building bridges, not walls. The meeting continued with community members sharing their stories and hopes for reform. When it ended, people lingered to talk, sign up for committees, and offer support. Terence watched Lily confidently moving through the crowd, shaking hands and answering questions. She caught his eye and smiled, no longer the scared teenager he'd first met on that street corner. She had found her purpose and Terence felt proud to be part of her journey. The early morning dew clung to the grass as Terence made his way through the cemetery's winding paths. White lilies nestled in the crook of his arm, their petals still fresh and pristine. He found Marcus's grave easily. He'd visited often enough to know the way by heart. The simple granite headstone stood against the pale morning sky, its inscription catching the first rays of sunlight. He fought for justice so others wouldn't have to. Terence carefully placed the lilies at the base of the stone, arranging them with gentle precision. Standing before the grave, Terence felt the weight of everything that had happened. Marcus had given up his freedom, his reputation, and ultimately his life to expose the truth. He'd endured years of separation from Lily, lived as a fugitive all because he refused to stay silent in the face of corruption. You changed everything, Terence said softly, his breath visible in the cool morning air. Not just the department, but me too. He touched his badge, remembering how differently he viewed it now. What once seemed like a simple symbol of authority had become a reminder of responsibility to the community, to justice, and to Marcus's memory. The past year had transformed the precinct. With Sykes and his network gone, younger officers looked to Terence for guidance. They wanted to learn how to serve with integrity, how to balance duty with justice. Each time Terence mentored a rookie or spoke at one of Lily's advocacy meetings, he felt Marcus's influence. I'll make sure it wasn't in vain, Terence promised, his voice firm despite the emotion tightening his throat. Every new officer who comes through that precinct will know what real courage looks like. They'll know your story. The sun climbed higher in the sky, casting long shadows across the cemetery grounds. 
Terence looked at his badge one last time, its surface catching the morning light. This small piece of metal held such power, power that could protect or oppress. He was determined to ensure it would always stand for justice, just as Marcus had fought for. If you enjoyed the story of Terence, I handpicked this next story that you will enjoy. Please don't miss this one. Click here to watch it.